Hello, Evangel family. I hope everyone is safe and well at home. I miss seeing everyone. It's strange not being able to gather together physically on a weekly basis for worship, but I'm so thankful for technology. I'm so thankful that we have this time together today. I thought because it's beautiful outside that we would have our Sunday school class outside today. Uh, we're going to be continuing our study uh, through the Ten Commandments, and we'll be looking specifically this morning at the Ninth Commandment, which we find in Exodus 20, verse 16. It says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Let's pray together and ask God's blessing upon this time that we have. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for this beautiful day. I'm thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that, that I have to be able to gather with my church family remotely, uh, for us to be able uh, to look at this passage of Scripture together today. And Father, even though uh, we are separated by distance, we are grateful that we are united by your Spirit. And as we look at the Ninth Commandment, we pray that your Spirit would, would be our God, would be our instructor. You would show us how this passage applies specifically to our lives and how we can respond in a way that is obedient and pleasing to you to this Ninth Commandment. And we pray this all in Christ's holy name. Amen. In December of 2001, George O'Leary was on top of the world. He had just been named the new head football coach for the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. It was his dream job. It was the job of a lifetime, and he couldn't have been more excited about it. Two days later, however, at the end of his first full day on the job, O'Leary watched helplessly as his dream turned into ashes right before his eyes. You see, a reporter had decided to run a story on him in which he was going to interview some of the guys that O'Leary had played college football with at the University of New Hampshire. The only problem was when he began making phone calls, no one remembered anyone by the name of O'Leary. This was because when O'Leary many years earlier had applied for his first coaching position at Syracuse, they had asked him for some background information about his athletic career. Some of the information that he shared was accurate and true, including his championships that he won in high school. But somehow that didn't seem impressive enough. And so O'Leary decided to make himself a three-year letterman at the University of New Hampshire. He didn't think it was a big deal. He didn't think it was that big of a lie. No one was ever going to even find out. But it ended up being a very significant lie, one that turned his dream into a nightmare, one that cost him his job, one that cost him his reputation. Sadly, George O'Leary isn't the only person who's lying on his resume. According to one survey of three million job applicants, nearly 50% of the resumes that were turned in contained at least one false statement. So while on the one hand, it seems like everyone condemns lying, on the other hand, it seems like everyone is guilty of it. But God's thoughts about lying are crystal clear. He detests a lying tongue. And he threatens serious consequences for anyone who engages in this sinful behavior. For example, if you look at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 20, we read, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. In Proverbs 12, in verse 22, we read, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. In Proverbs 21, 6, we read, Getting treasures by a lying tongue is the fleeting fantasy of those who seek death. And in Revelation 22, in verses 14 and 15, we read, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, 
and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. God hates a lying tongue. And that's why he commands us in Exodus 20, 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, the immediate context of this commandment, of course, is the court of law. It governs the legal testimony that a witness gives in a public trial before a jury. In other words, most specifically, the ninth commandment condemns a lying witness, someone who testifies falsely against someone accused of a crime. And this is significant because in the ancient world, the judicial system was very different from our own. Oftentimes, people were presumed guilty until proven innocent. And people could be convicted of a crime and even sentenced to death on no more than just the testimony of a single witness. But God gave his people a completely different standard for judicial fairness. God ordered that when someone was put on trial in Israel that he would appear before a jury of elders. He was to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, and that there had to be more than one witness in order to convict. For example, we read in Deuteronomy 19.15, one witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Not only that, but... When someone was sentenced to die, the accuser, according to Deuteronomy 17.7, 7, was asked to be the first one to throw the stone. In other words, if you accuse someone else of a crime that resulted in the death penalty, then you had to participate in the execution. It's one thing to falsely accuse someone of a crime, but, but something totally different to personally put them to death knowing that they are innocent. Furthermore, if the allegations were proven to be false, then the accuser was to be punished. Deuteronomy 19, verses 18 to 19 says, The judge must make a thorough investigation, and if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against his brother, then do to him as he intended to do to his brother. Imagine how such a law would impact our judicial system today it would probably help get rid of at least half the cases that are on the court's dockets. But of course, the courtroom is not the only place where a person can lie. If you notice, the Ten Commandments always forbids the most extreme form of a sin. And so murder is the most extreme form of hatred. Adultery is the worst form of sexual sin because it breaks the covenant of marriage. And similarly, the Ninth Commandment forbids the worst type of lie one that condemns an innocent man for a crime that he did not commit. But God hates all forms of deceit, the big lies as well as the small ones. He hates our half-truths, our flatteries, our exaggerations and misinformation. What we say may be true as far as it goes, but then we, we choose to leave out certain details that might put us at a disadvantage. Or we say something that's technically true and yet, nevertheless, it's intended to deceive. We overstate our accomplishments, putting ourselves in the best possible light. And at the same time, we have a tendency to exaggerate other people's failings, thinking and saying the worst about others. We mislead, we misquote, we misinterpret, we twist people's words, taking things out of context. In these and many other ways, we exchange the truth for a lie. The most blatant violation of the Ninth Commandment is any lie that harms someone else. Now, what is especially forbidden is a falsehood that injures a neighbor. See, with our tongues, God has given this, this incredible capacity, this capacity to worship Him and bless others and even tell others the good news of the gospel. But unfortunately, our tongues have been corrupted by sin. And because of that, Oftentimes, they are the most dangerous and destructive parts of our body. As James writes in James chapter 3, the tongue corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire 
by hell. Like a massive forest fire set by a single careless individual, a lying tongue consumes everything in its path. This is especially true when it comes to gossip. When the Bible condemns gossip, it means something more than just casual talk about other people's business. Gossip is talking about people in a way that damages their reputation. In Proverbs 22, 1, we read, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver and gold. Gossip tries to steal our greatest treasure, our good name, our reputation. When it's done in speech, it's called slander. When it's done in writing, it's called libel. But either way, the victims of gossip never get a chance to defend themselves. They never have a chance to explain their circumstances or clarify their, their motives or correct misconceptions. Instead, they're charged and tried and convicted in the, the courtroom of public opinion. Although typically gossip contains a lot of hearsay and rumor and innuendo, even if, if what is being communicated is 100% accurate, it can still violate the spirit of the ninth commandment when it's said to the wrong person for the wrong reason. And that's why when we get ready to speak, we need to ask ourselves three questions. First, we need to ask ourselves, is what I'm about to say true? Secondly, if so, does it really need to be said to this person and this conversation? And then thirdly, would I put it in this way if the person that I'm talking about was here to listen? Those are three important questions that we should always ask ourselves before we open our mouths to speak. Scripture makes it clear that lying has no place in the life of a believer. In Ephesians 4.25, we're told, Therefore put away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. In this verse, we are commanded to put away our lying tendencies because it's characteristic of our old nature, the old nature that we're instructed to put off and to kill and to remove from our lives. But of course, this is easier said than done. The truth is, in, in one way or another, we're all liars. And yet Christ is calling us to be truth tellers in all things. And so how do we put off that old habit of telling a lie when it's convenient and put on a new habit where we always are speaking the truth? Well, I think to begin with, we need to understand our motivations for lying. And I think two of the primary motivations behind our lies is fear and greed. Fear and greed. Or to be more specific, two types of fear and two types of greed. If you would, look with me in your Bibles. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21. And I want us to look together at verses 23 through 27. Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 27. We read, Now when he came into the temple, speaking of Christ, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if, if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. And so they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. In this passage, Christ is having a conversation with the religious leaders of Jerusalem, the, the chief priests and the scribes. And they want to know by what authority is he doing the things that he's doing. Now, if you go back just a few verses, you'll find that Christ has just cleansed the temple of the money changers. And they want to know by what authority is he doing that. Christ has also been healing in the temple and teaching in the temple. 
although, that he, although he's not considered officially a priest or a scribal authority. And so they're trying to trap Christ and they're asking him, by what authority are you doing these things? But instead of answering them directly, Christ asks his own question. He asks them, when it comes to the baptism of John, was that baptism from heaven? Was it from God or was it from men? Now, the religious leaders have to think carefully about their answer. On the one hand, if they say that John's baptism was from heaven, which they didn't believe, then basically they were saying that John was indeed a prophet. And of course, one of the things that John prophesied about was Christ being the Messiah. And so they would be elevating Christ's own ministry by the, and by the same stroke, they would be diminishing themselves in the eyes of the people. But on the other hand, if they said that John's baptism, uh, it was just simply for men, then they feared the people because the people all counted John to be a prophet and they were afraid that they might physically harm them. So what do they do? They decide to be evasive. They decide to be politically correct. And they simply say, we do not know, which was not an accurate answer because in their minds and hearts, John was really not a prophet. They were lying. You see, there were two types of fear at play here. On the one hand, they were afraid of elevating Christ's ministry and diminishing their own. They were afraid of, of having egg on their face in front of the people. But on the other hand, they also feared their physical safety. And oftentimes, we lie for these same very reasons. We, we lie because we want to save face with others. Right? We make a mistake and then we lie about it because we don't want others to think less of us. We don't want others uh, to put us down. We don't want to embarrass ourselves, and so we lie. But on the other hand, we sometimes lie for our own safety. Right? If we, if we don't uh, tell a lie, we could find ourselves in trouble. Maybe when we have done something wrong, uh, we, we know that if we speak the truth, there are going to be consequences, and so we choose to tell a lie. We're motivated to lie oftentimes by fear. But we're also sometimes motivated by greed as well. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, we'll be looking at another story that's fairly familiar, I think, to most of us. Acts chapter 5, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. And so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Now, when you go back in the book of Acts to the end of chapter 4, one of the things that you find that was prevalent in the early church was individuals being willing to, to sell land and sell other possessions and take the proceeds and bring it to the apostles so that they can meet the needs of others. One such individual was Barnabas. Barnabas sold uh, a plot of land and he brought the proceeds before the apostles and he was known by the apostles as the son of encouragement. He had a good reputation in the church. Well, most likely this motivated Ananias and his wife Sapphira to go and, and to sell a possession of their own and to bring the proceeds and, and place them at the apostles' feet. They wanted the same recognition they wanted the same type of reputation. They wanted to be elevated in the eyes of the apostles and, and others in the early church. The only thing was, uh, they were greedy for that reputation. They were greedy uh, for uh, you know, others to think well of them. But they were also greedy for money. And so they held back a portion of the proceeds. They acted like they were sacrificing it all on the sake of Christ's church, but, but really they were just giving part. And they were holding back some of the money for themselves. They were, they were greedy for money and they were greedy uh, for admiration. 
Well, Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, sees right through it. And he says to Ananias, when you owned uh, the piece of land, was it not your own to do with it however you, you wished? But when you sold it, you could have spent the money any way you wished. And yet you acted as if you were going to sacrifice all of that money. You were going to give all of that money to the church when in reality you were only giving back a portion of it. And so in that you were being deceitful. You were lying not to me as an apostle and not even to the church. You were lying to the Holy Spirit. And immediately he fell dead. Later, as you continue to read in the story, you find that Sapphira repeats the lie of her husband and she too is stricken dead. The point of this, though, is that, that not only does God take lying extremely seriously, and we see that very clearly in the story, but that Ananias and Sapphira were motivated in their lies by greed. And so greed is another major motivation that leads us to lie. And so we need to search our own hearts. We need to think about those times when we find ourselves filled with, with fear or filled maybe with greed, we need to recognize that we'll be tempted to lie on those occasions. And we need to guard ourselves against those occasions. We need to be extra committed to speaking the truth when we're afraid or when we are tempted to be greedy. But we also need to recognize that when we speak the truth, according to Ephesians 4.15, we're to speak the truth in love. And so it's not just about speaking the truth. It's not just about telling things accurately it's also about doing so in a way that's motivated by love. You know, some people pride themselves in, uh, in being truth tellers. They pride themselves in their honesty, and yet sometimes they use the truth as a sledgehammer in the lives of others. It's almost like they delight in hurting others with the truth. Well, that should never be our motivation. Yes, we should always speak the truth, but we should always want to do so in a way that builds others up. Even when we have to tell someone something that's difficult, something that's hard, something we know they don't want to hear, we should do so only because it's our desire to help them. It's our desire to see them grow in their relationship with Christ. It's only because we love them that we speak this truth, not because in some way we want to hurt them or manipulate them in some way. And so as believers, we're always called to be truth tellers but we're also called to be truth tellers who are motivated by love is that true of you what is the truth about you what lies maybe are you telling are you what lies are you telling yourself what lies perhaps are you telling others and if you're speaking the truth are you speaking the truth with the intent of of helping others are you motivated by love or are you taking the truth and are you using it like a weapon trying to hurt those around you? It's very important that we both speak the truth and that we speak the truth in love. And so I want to encourage you as you uh, go into the rest of your week to, to take the time to really reflect on this ninth commandment. It is so easy for us to just twist the truth just a little bit and th think nothing of it. I mean, we're so surrounded by lies in our culture and society today that we almost don't hear them anymore. But for us as Christians, we want to have a sensitive conscience when it comes to the truth. And so I encourage you to ask the Lord to show you where maybe there are areas in your life where you have not been fully honest, where you're not speaking the truth, and where you need to repent and to put off that old man of, of speaking lies and, and begin to be, uh, to be a a speaker of truth in all things. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much uh, for this time that you have given us in your word as we have meditated on the ninth commandment. And Lord, uh, we confess that we are liars, that in some way, maybe uh, it's an exaggeration of our own accomplishment, maybe it's us speaking a lie in order to protect ourselves from uh, from being looked down on or to keep ourselves out of trouble. Uh, Lord, we all have a tendency uh, to be less than 100% honest. And we ask that you would forgive us. And we thank you that where we have failed to completely obey this ninth commandment, Christ obeyed it perfectly in our place. And so, Lord, it's to his righteousness that we cling. And yet at the same time, 
We want to put off the old men and put on the new. And we want to reflect the Lord Jesus and being speakers of truth and love. And we pray this all in Christ's holy name.